Okay, today our recording is going to cover categories of pathogens. So our main topics are listed here, so we're going to talk about the different categories we put organisms in and how we classify them, basically based around how they reproduce, how they reproduce and whether or not they have a cell wall. So first off, let's start by talking about classification of microbes in part because understanding of infectious disease requires a recognition of the relationship between microbes and other living things. The modern breakdown of these kingdoms lists five kingdoms for all living things. The two most obvious kingdoms are the plantae and animalia, more traditionally known as plants and animals. However, many of the agents that may cause infectious disease reside in, other, in the other three kingdoms. Bacteria make up the kingdom of the prokaryote, the fungi kingdom, fungi, and the free living cells such as amoeba and other protozoa, the kingdom um, protestia. Viruses are not placed in any of these kingdoms. Viruses appear to be partial forms of living systems and will be discussed later. So when we talk about a prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells, remember all living things can be divided in these two types of cells. So it's especially important characteristic of the prokaryotic that distinguishes its members from those in other kingdoms, and that's the lack of a nuclear me membrane and other subcellular organelles, such as mitochondria. For this reason, bacteria are referred to as prokaryotes and are considered to have a relatively simple cellular organization compared with those of the fungi, protozoa, plants, and animals which exhibit true nucleus defined by the presence of a nuclear membrane as well as other subcellular organelles. Because fungi and protozoa have a cellular structure with a defined nucleus, they are referred to as eukaryocytes. So eukaryocytes, again, have a nuclear membrane. They're in this one or more one or more paired linear chromosomes. And the other differentiation is that cellular division occurs by mitosis. So if we look at mitosis, again that's the process in which a eukaryo cell separates the chromosomes into its cell nucleus and two identical um, sets are formed. So this is true for all eukaryocytes, including fungi, plants, and animals. However, not bacteria. So again, the easiest way to remember this is just there's two chromosomes. Those are replaced and divided into a cell. Prokaryocytes here have no nuclear membrane and usually used for one cellular chromosomes. So, um, so, and these divide by binary fish, fission, and this is how bacteria divides. So when we look at binary division, you can kind of think of subdivision of a cell. So a prokaryotype, you kind of think of having this wad of chromosomes. They duplicate those chromosomes and then divide into cells. So now we have this list of these categories of infectious agents. Here are our categories. Um, basically done with some cell classification. And bacteria are the most common cause of that that we identify. But we'll talk about each of these other ones also. E-O. Okay, I have a slide missing, but I will fill this in um, on the PowerPoint. So 
again, bacteria are the most abundant of all um, of all organisms. They're the smallest organism that contains all the biochemical machinery necessary to sustain life and allow for reproduction. Bacteria have an average size of one micrometer to ten micrometers. So bacteria are grouped by their three classic shapes. The first is the coccyx, which is an oval bacteria. Within those, there's a, the diplococcus, which is a pair of cocci, streptococcus, which is a chain. Staphylococcus is more irregular, um, or uh, sarcina, which is a cube. Then there's the rotter bacillus and a spiral. So the thing to remember about these bacterial organisms is that they have a response to antibiotics. They can be identified under a microscope by these different shapes that they have or their morphology. If you think of strepto, you want to think of a strip or a stripe. Um, and then a spiral is another way to remember these that are termed um, that would be as pictured in shape E. Okay, now let's look at these shapes. So remember, what are these? They're bacteria, so they're a prokaryotic cell. So the first one there, A, this shape would be described as bacilli with and without flagella. B is streptococcus. C is staphylococcus or that grape type organization. D is a diplococcal. E is a spirochete that's fairly thick. F is a club or rod or a vibro. G is a filamentous. And H is streptobacilli. The next category we'll talk about a little bit are fungi or yeasts that incorporates yeasts and molds. So fungi are assuming an increasingly important role in disease as a result of widespread use of antibiotics and steroids that predispose patients to opportunistic fungal infections. Remember, we think of a patient using an inhaled corticosteroid, and if that corticosteroid is not rinsed from the mouth, it provides an opportunity for a fungal infection. There's over 50,000 species of fungi that are distributed worldwide. However, only about 50 to 70 species are recognized to cause disease in humans. Similar to animals and most bacteria, fungi are heterotrophic. As a result of their inability to synthesize carbohydrates from raw carbon sources, they require organic substances as nutrients to form energy. In this respect, they either attack organic matter as um, sparophytes or parasiticize them. Ordinarily found as scavengers in the external environment, they grow in soil, vegetation, woods, nitrogenous wastes um, such as excretion from animals or birds. Man is exposed through direct skin penetration or by inhaling fungal spores or by becoming an accidental host of a fungal infection from some other source. Because fungal spores are lightweight and they become airborne easily, the respiratory tract is a likely portal of entry for this infection. Mild to severe pulmonary involvement is often exhibited. Some fungi, 
such as candida albicans are part of the normal flora of the body. These fungi can produce fungal infections in a compromised host or as a result of a medical intervention, such as the administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Protozoa are the simplest life form. So we think of these Fagilla will have a little tail. Um, I think most of you remember amoeba and ciliates. There's not a lot of protozoal infections in the United States. The one that we see occasionally is um, giardia or traveler's diarrhea. So what about viruses? Viruses are kind of this unique kind of um, fourth category. They are the leading cause of infectious disease. The frequency of the common cold alone is enough to emphasize this point. In comparison to other infectious agents, the viruses far outnumber other microbes in causing illness. Also important is the fact that viral infections can often predispose an individual to a serious infection by bacteria. This point is particularly true in respect to viral infections of the lowest, lower respiratory tract, such as influenza. An important question is, what are viruses? It can be answered in one of two ways. One answer is that viruses are the most simple form of microbes known. The other is that they exist somewhere between the living and the non-living. They are not cells, but particles of proteins and nucleic acids occasionally associated with lipids and carbohydrates. The protein forms a coat or capsid around the nucleic acid core. The nucleic acid can be either dRNA or rRNA, but not both. These complex particles of organic biomolecules are known as virones. Some virones also have phospholipid envelope, which is derived from the membrane of the host cell during the infectious process. Viruses range in size from 17 to 300 millimicrons in diameter. Although virons, like bacteria, can have different shapes, this is a picture here um, on the slide that's fairly typical. So they, viruses need a living host cell. A viral culture is cultured must be cultured then within living cells. So sometimes you'll see a blood auger which has which is a special container with living cells. These are difficult to grow outside the body. So basically they're sitting on a cell and attaching for um, for nutrients. So what about prions? Prions are a newer category that have come into play. Um, so between 1984 and 1986, cattle across England were observed to develop a disease characterized by these strange symptoms that included kind of apprehensive or aggressive behavior, some muscle tremors, and weight loss. These animals became uncoordinated and inevitably died within a few months to a year. Laboratory studies revealed that the brains of the cows were filled with sponge-like holes and protein deposits. This condition was declared a new cattle disease called mad cow disease that you may have heard about in the news. Medically, this condition was referred to as bovine spongioform encephalopathy, or BSE. However, people will still kind of use the term mad cow disease because we remember that. Unfortunately, in the 1990s, humans were believed to have eaten the beef from the infected cattle. The understanding is now that BSE is caused by a unique transmittable agent classified as a prion. 
Prions are a form of protein that either self-replicate or somehow convert normal brain proteins into abnormal ones. The belief is that prions are also the cause of other known forms of human spongioform encephalopathies, such as um, a disease called Kuru, K-U-R-U, and Crutzfield Jacob disease or CJD. Kuru was first observed in the early 1900s among um, the ritualistic cannibals in Papua New Guinea but disappeared in 1960 when the Australian territory stopped cannibalism for the most part. CJD, the Crutchfeld Jacob disease, although extremely rare, is believed to be primarily inherited. However, it's been shown to be um, to involve some sort of transmissible agent. The transmission has been demonstrated by injecting primate brain tissue from a CJD patient at postmortem. Thus, the transmission of the CJD agent from person to person is also believed to occur, perhaps by procedures involving tissue grafts or even contaminated surgical instruments. Again, it doesn't fit into any other category, um, so it is a standalone organism or a disease-causing organism. Again, this CJD it affects the central nervous system of the brain in humans. So what about bacteriophages? These are viruses that attack bacteria. It looks like a virus. It basically injects its material into the host cell and the virus is killed. We occasionally try to do this, to use this in a helpful way. Certain viruses are not treatable such as hepatitis, so we try to prevent those with a vaccine. So, helminthes and um, nematodes are such organisms as roundworms, hookworms, and pinworms. So, roundworms or nematodes are parasites that can infect people. They usually are living in the intestines. There are different species of worms that can cause these infections, and they range in length from one millimeter to a meter. Most often, eggs or larvae live in the soil and get into the body when a person gets them on their hands or and then transfers them to their mouth. They can all, some can get into the body through the skin. Um, like other parasitic diseases, roundworms infections are more common in warm tropical climates, and we don't see a lot of those here in Idaho. However, worldwide they um, are said to affect about a billion people. Okay, ectoparasites. These are arthropods that attach and live on the skin. They're different than a vector. They're, a, they're their own category of microorganism. This is something like um, a wood tick or a tick. Um, here in Idaho, we have sheep ticks that will cause um, various problems. Ooh, sorry. Here's my last grouping here of the microorganisms. These here are a little, um, a little unique. Um, chlamydia is a disease caused by the bacteria. Chlamydia trachomitis. It's most commonly sexually transmitted. 
Um, so these are similar to a bacteria because they divide by that binary fission and are susceptible to antibiotics, but lack other certain categories, so they are placed in their own, own cate category. Rickettsia is a... Uh, um, it can present as a cocci or a rod. Um, let's see, rickettsia are commonly carried by ticks and fleas and lice and cause some human disease. Um, there's something called rickettsia pox that can be similar to that. Um, African tick bite or Rocky Mountain spotted fever falls into this category. And mycoplasms, this is again um, a, like a bacteria but without a cell wall. Um, but they are not affected by antibiotics. And um, these will cause some sorts of atypical pneumonia and other respiratory disorders and they are believed to be involved in some pelvic inflammatory disease. Mycoplasma is the smallest known cell. Okay, so how do we go about identifying these different organisms? Well, we're going to talk about these different, different methods listed here. So we think about the different categories, go back through those that we talked about and what you'll want to start doing is looking in your patient's um, lab reports or their microbiology reports. So when we talk about culturing, that's the oldest and still the most common where we get some sort of sampling of the flu fluid um, or sputum and we put it in some sort of medium. Viruses are sent away and they generally take about a week to get back, so viruses are going to take longer, but even culturing takes several days. So you guys probably all did this in in uh, some one of your science classes where you have some sort of material for this to grow on and they swab or spatter the agent on the culture and we see the results. Some things grow fast, some grow slow, and most often it's going to take at least three days to get a full report. So at 24 hours we get a first report, the second report comes about 48 hours later, and then we get a 72 hour report to see where the growth is. Some labs will even go up to five days. So then we have a gram stain. A gram stain helps us figure out whether or not it's a positive or a gram negative organism that we're going to treat differently. So in addition to the shape or spatial arrangement of bacterial cells, the staining properties give us some major distinctions that are medically important for treating bacteria. The main staining procedures use this in regard to the gram stain and then we'll talk about the acid fast stain in a second. The gram stain is a dye of crystal violet which stains the organism blue. The decolorizing agent is usually alcohol. After the decolorizing step, smears are stained with, the counter, with a counter stain, usually saffron or red dye. Bacteria that appear blue after the gram stain are called gram positive. Those that decolorize and take up the red counter stain are called gram negative. So it's either called red or pink and gram positive is going to be purple or blue. So there's that gram stain. Really important to know the difference between those. Then we have this acid fast stain or something called the zeal nielsen stain. The acid fast stain is reserved mainly for a few microbes that have high lipid content. 
for example those that cause tuberculosis. Smears are first stained with a red stain. Acid fast organisms such as mycobacteria retain the red stain when treated with the solution of acid alcohol. Thus bacteria that appear red after being stained by the acid fast technique are referred to as acid fast. Another type of differentiation is this polymerase chain reaction. This is a newer test and we get results back fairly quick. This is how they will do that, um, the strep, when they check patients in the office or in the hospital or emergency department for strep throat. This is a um, PCR reaction where it's basically cloning a particular piece of the DNA in a test tube rather than in living cells. So they extract these DNA samples and perform this test. The best thing is that it's very rapid. However, it's, um, it's overly sensitive if there's contaminants in the air. So it looks for the DNA or the RNA of those certain bacteria. Whereas strep throat cultures used to take more than 24 hours to know, now we can know generally in less than a day. So what we see with strep throat is that white patch of oozing and we culture that white part, that can, the contamination though, though of white blood cells in the mouth. So immunoassays are used to exploit the specificity and sensitivity of the reaction between antigen and antibody. So it's an antigen antibody reaction. This can be used for HIV, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Hepatitis, or Epstein-Barr. This is also the way one would type a blood. Um, Okay. Another way to look at um, the type of organism is called a uh, canary, and this is a canary is short for cellular analysis and notification of antigen risks and yields. It's highly sensitive and highly specific. So we take these live smell cells. We just have a tiny, tiny bit of bacteria and we can find that, um, find what kind of cell is there. This isn't used very much in the medical setting. It's more reserved for like CSI shows. Um, but it, 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 it can be, it can be used. It's just not used a lot. There's also a nucleic acid testing, which is NAT. It's a biochemical technique that's used to de detect viruses and bacteria. They were again de developed to shorten the um, time between when a patient has been affected and when they would show up positive in a, on an antibody test. So again, here we're looking at protein and RNA and DNA and that with just a few bacteria or virus they can get quick results. So when we donate blood this is how it's a nucleic acid test. Well they'll use this to also determine if somebody has hepatitis and it gives a quicker response in those that have been exposed to HIV. So a little bit on to antibiotics. We know antibiotics will kill bacteria. So we have these different spectrums of antibiotic. And what I like to think of this is if you, um, if you think of a BB gun, those BBs are really small. It's a very narrow spectrum. We're going to only kill the, the things that we hit, maybe these gram-positive organisms. Or if you think of as an assault rifle, that's a broad spectrum. Um, and, and it's going to kill everything in its path, or much more things.
It's kind of like thinking about shooting a deer with a cannon. What, or what we really want to do is find the best gun. Idaho is a hunting state. We want to find the best gun to do the job, but not a lot of other damage. In the hospital, however, patients are often started on a broad spectrum because they come in really sick and they don't know what we have. And then they narrow it down to find out where, where we need to go with these antibiotics. So when we think about antimicrobial chemotherapy, that's our antifungal, antibiotics, antiprozoal drugs, those drugs that we have to destroy the pathogens, we're going to classify them based on the type of cells they have, they act upon, their range of activity, and where they're going to act. So broad and narrow spectrums, some medications will cross the blood-brain barrier and some don't. If a patient has a disease like or illness like meningitis, we need that medication then that will cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, then we look at sites of activity. So what does it kill and where does it go? And, how, and then we need to figure out how do they work. Do they rupture the cell membrane? Do they go to the powerhouse of the mitochondria? Where do they work? Where do they reproduce? Or how do they keep reproduction from occurring? If we look at antimicrobial effects on the cells, remember these terms. Bactericidal will kill the microorganism. Bacteriostatic will inhibit the growth or decrease the number of cells. And then when we think about toxicology, we know that antibiotics are life-saving, but they can also pose many threats to the patient, such as overgrowth of pathogen, depression of the intestinal symbiosis, ne it can be toxic um, nephrotoxicity, um, ototoxicity, aplastic anema and hypersensitivity. So we want to be really we want to be really cautious about knowing these side effects and looking at the medications that we're giving.